Good afternoon on the Sunday, April, May, March 22nd, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm Yuna Nofa, you're watching the English News. Those are today's headlines. Progressive Socialist Party leader Woody Jim Lott meets with the French president to discuss the situation in Lebanon and Syria. Shia militia in Yemen sees the airport in a key central city as deteriorating security prompt Washington to evacuate personnel and the UN Security Council to call an emergency session. President Barack Obama says Netanyahu's re-election disavowal of a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict makes it hard to find a path to serious negotiations. Progressive Socialist Party leader Wali Jamlat met with French President François Hollande to discuss the situation in Lebanon and Syria. The party leader, who is also the political leader of Lebanon's minority Druze sect, called on France and other countries to support Syrian refugees sheltering in Lebanon. The UN estimates that around 212,000 Syrians live in besieged areas beyond the reach of humanitarian aid. More than 200,000 now have been killed in the Syrian conflict, which began in 2011 with protest against the rule of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. It has driven 3.9 million Syrians away from their shattered homeland. Hezbollah is preventing the establishment of a Lebanese state. Those are the words of Lebanese forces leader Samir Jaja. He says what is disrupting the formation of a state in Lebanon is the presence of Hezbollah as a state within a state. He was speaking to Saudi Arabian journalist Ahmad Adnan in a YouTube interview. He said Hezbollah's arms and the method of its presence contradict with the notion of a legitimate state. He also said that his criticism of the party seems to stem from an objection to policies seen as highly linked to foreign alliances that contradict with a local vision for the country. Our relationship with Hezbollah, he said, is not based on enmity but opposition. All the Lebanese possess a particular vision of the country and this is a nation based on the Taif Agreement, the Constitution and the law. No disruptive factor can last indefinitely and this was of course in direct reference to Hezbollah. Maronite Patriarch Shadadai urged Lebanese politicians to acknowledge the disastrous repercussions of the presidential vacuum almost a year of it now. Officials should acknowledge the shortcomings of their political practices and should also comprehend the magnitude of the 10th month-long presidential vacuum since May 25th of last year and its dire results on public institutions as a whole. Officials should acknowledge these repercussions in order to see the country's ailing economic situation that is characterized by growing debt and budget deficit. The presidential vacuum, I added, should also be considered when acknowledging the effect of the mass influx of Syrian refugees they have had on Lebanese politics, economy, security, and living conditions. He added that the void should also be cast against the increase in poverty and deprivation suffered by citizens who are being barred from the basic right of decent living. The Islamic State extremist group known as ISIS has claimed responsibility for a series of attacks across Syria that left dozens of people dead in an announcement on its radio station. In the message broadcast last night on Al Bayan radio, ISIS said it was behind explosions targeting Kurdish New Year festivities in northeastern Syria and raids on government position in the central province of Hama. 45 people, including at least 12 children, were killed in twin bombings in the northeastern city of Hasake on Friday as they marked their New Year's Eve. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights head, Rami Abdelrahman, said people were too scared to celebrate on Saturday, fearing more attacks. The ISIS radio station said the group detonated a car and a bike rigged with explosives in Hasake city, which is controlled by Kurdish fighters and Syrian regime forces. Coming up next. U.S. First Lady Michelle Obama promotes an empowerment initiative for girls in Cambodia. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching the 420 o'clock news on Future Television. In a fresh rebuke to Benjamin Netanyahu, President Barack Obama said the Israeli leader's pre-election disavowal of a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict makes it hard to find a path towards serious negotiations to resolve the issue. 
In an interview with the Huffington Post, Obama also scolded Netanyahu over his remarks about Arab-Israelis voting, making it clear that the deep rift in relations between Israel and the United States, its more important ally, is not ending anytime soon. I did indicate to him that we continue to believe that a two-state solution is the only way for the long-term security of Israel if it wants to stay both a Jewish state and democratic. Uh, and uh, I indicated to him that uh, given his statements prior to the election, uh, it is going to be hard to find a path where people uh, are seriously uh, believing that negotiations are possible. So we are going to continue to insist that from our point of view, the status quo is unsustainable and that while taking into complete account Israel's security, uh, we can't just uh, in perpetuity maintain the status quo, expand settlements. That's not a recipe for, is, uh, for stability in the region. Is there any reason at this point to believe that he's serious about a Palestinian state? Uh, well, we take him at his word when he said that uh, it wouldn't happen during his uh, prime ministership. And so uh, that's why we've got to evaluate uh, what other uh, options are available to make sure that we don't see uh, a chaotic situation in the region. And what was your reaction to his warning on election day about Arab voters, quote, heading to the polls in droves? We indicated uh, that that kind of rhetoric was contrary to uh, what is the best of Israel's traditions. It, uh, that uh, although Israel was founded based on the historic Jewish homeland and uh, the need to have uh, a Jewish homeland. Uh, Israeli democracy has been premised on everybody in the country being treated equally and fairly. And uh, I think that that is what's best about Israeli democracy. Uh, if, if that uh, is lost, uh, then I think that uh, not only uh, does it give ammunition to folks who don't, uh, don't believe in, in uh, in a Jewish state, but it also, uh, I think, starts to erode. Yeah. Um, uh, you know the meaning of democracy. I mean, can you country. unring that bell, basically? Well, uh, I think that's probably a question better addressed to uh, the prime minister. That's our next sit down, obviously. American what public and this Congress. I, I, I don't think it will have a significant impact. Obviously, there's significant skepticism uh, in uh, Israel generally about Iran, and understandably, Iran has made vile comments, uh, anti-Semitic comments, comments about the destruction of Israel. Uh, it is precisely for that reason that even before I became president, I said Iran could not have a nuclear weapon. Uh, what is going to have an impact on whether we get uh, a deal done is, number one, is Iran prepared to show, to prove to the world that it is not developing a nuclear weapon, and can we verify that in an intrusive, consistent way? Uh, and frankly, they have not yet made uh, uh, you know the the kind of concessions that are I think going to be needed for a final deal to get done. But they have moved, and and so there's a, the, the possibility. Uh, and the other thing is going to be me being able to show not just the American people or the Israeli people, but the world, that in fact uh, we have mechanisms in place that will prevent Iran from having a nuclear weapon. Uh, and that the deal that is made uh, not only is verifiable, but it also uh, makes it much less likely that Iran is able to break out than if we have no deal at all. Sure. And that's an argument that we're going to have to make if we have a deal. Sure. But we still got well, some that's more my next do. question. So recent reports say that a draft is circulating, but there are other reports that says a sticking point remains over the pace of UN sanctions relief. Mm -hmm. So where do things stand now, and how firm are you on the idea that international sanctions relief must be phased out over time? There is no deal until everything is worked out. And uh, I think that uh, it's premature to suggest that there's a draft out there. What is true is, is that there has been movement from the Iranian side. Uh, we are consulting with the P5 plus one. Uh, negotiations have uh, broken for uh, a week because of uh, the Nowruz holidays uh, inside of Iran, uh, which gives time for us to make sure that uh, everybody within the P5 plus one is comfortable with uh, the current positions that are being taken. 
it allows them to consult. We'll be back in uh, a week. Our goal, though, is to get this done in a matter of weeks, not months. Yemen's Shia rebels have seized parts of the southern city of Taiz and its airport that are pushing to seize more territory across the country. Correspondents say the rebels, known as Houthis, are pushing south towards the city of Aden, where President Abdul Rabbu Mansur al-Hadi has set up a rival administration after the Houthis forced him out of power. The rebels seized the airport of Taiz, the third largest city, after clashes with forces loyal to Hadi. Tens of tanks and armored personnel carrying Houthi fighters had crossed into Adhali and Aden governorates. A Yemeni political activist, Ahmed al Wafi, said the Houthis had taken full control of Taiz military airbase and had deployed fighters to man checkpoints at the city's entry points and streets. Tunisian security forces have begun a manhunt for a third attacker in the assault on the Bardot Museum that killed 21 people, mostly foreign tourists. President Biji Kaid Essebsi spoke with French TV network iTele from inside the Bardot Museum on Sunday, saying the attack involved three aggressors and that the third man had escaped. Tunisia's interior ministry released security camera footage of Wednesday's attack, showing two gunmen walking through the museum, carrying assault rifles and bags. At one point, they encountered a third man with a backpack walking down a flight of stairs. They briefly acknowledged each other before walking in opposite directions. The footage was accompanied by two stills set to be showing the bodies of the two gunmen named Yassine Labdi, 20 years old, and 26-year-old Hatem Khashnawi. Both men were killed after the assault. U.S. First Lady Michelle Obama has promoted an empowerment initiative for girls in Cambodia, meeting school children and also Peace Corps volunteers involved in education projects in the country. Accompanied by Cambodia's First Lady, Bunrani Hon Sen, she visited a school in Siem Reap province where Cambodia's most famous historical site, Angkor Wat, is located. At Prasad Baking College, Obama met with schoolgirls to talk about the recently announced Let Girls Learn program. She also participated in a roundtable discussion with Peace Corps volunteers, local community leaders, and civil society members who are implementing projects to support girls' education in Cambodia. A Los Angeles candy shop claims it set a Guinness World Record. The candy factory in North Hollywood used a kiddie pool as a mold for melted chocolate and peanut butter in an attempt to make the world's largest peanut butter cup. That looks delicious. The owners told local media they poured more than 199 kilograms of ingredients into the peanut butter cup, which would beat the previous world record by 86 kilograms, according to reports. The candy factory says that once the world record is verified, the peanut butter cup will be broken down and sold in 0.5 kilogram pieces, with the proceeds going all to charity. Those are our headlines for today. Let me remind you of them. Progressive Socialist Party leader Wali Jablat meets with French President François Hollande to discuss the situation in Lebanon and Syria. Shia militia in Yemen sees the airport in a key central city as deteriorating security prompts Washington to evacuate personnel and the UN Security Council to call an emergency session. And Barack Obama says Netanyahu's pre-election disavowal of a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is only making it a harder way to find a path towards serious negotiations. Your Sunday headlines live on Future Television. Catch us again tomorrow for its making headlines around the world. Signing off. Take care.